May of 1973, I received the Eagle Scout um, rank uh, in scouting. Now, that was a long, long time ago. Um, a lot of water and things under the bridge since 1973. And in fact, I will tell you that many things in scouting since 1973 has changed. They have changed greatly. But I will also tell you that there are some things within the scouting um, lessons, the things that they teach, that are very, very good, even to this day. And so, like myself, who were, uh, was a scout, and I know Benjamin is a scout, and we have the uh, 2019 Okanichi Council Noose River Scout Leader of the Year present today in Frank Johnston. <laughs> if, if we were to, uh, us that are in scouting, ask the congregation, what is the scout motto, what would you say? Be prepared. Be prepared. Now, I will tell you that it is important as a scout to be prepared. They teach many things that are good, uh, how to be prepared. But I will also tell you that being prepared goes way beyond scouting. Goes way beyond scouting. So as you were growing up, my guess would be is that Many of you, I cannot say uh, for certain, all of you, but many of you prepared for tests because you knew if you did not prepare for test, there was going to be a failure at the end of that test. Now, some of you are so bright, I know you just, you didn't have to study, you didn't have to do that, uh, but many of us aren't that way. And some of the kids in here today are having to study for exams uh, this coming week, um, needless to say, my daughter. And, and so we have to prepare, or we know that, well, it may not turn out very well. Um, it's that way in life. Uh, if you do not prepare for life, when something unexpected happens, it, it, it just rocks your world. And all of us have had that experience where something that is uh, something we're not prepared for happens, um, then you just kind of sometimes just fall to the ground or fall on your knees and say, what in the world is this going on? How can I handle this? Um, being prepared was not only important to me when I was a scout, but Many of you know that I was a law enforcement officer in the military. And in military training, and those of you that have served in the military know that training exercises are nothing more than scenarios that teach you what to do if this happens. And so in every instant, we would go through a training exercise, and then you would have debriefing at the end. And the debriefing was, okay, what did you do right? What did you do wrong? How can you correct that? Because this is a real-life situation that can happen, and you need to be prepared what to do. Fortunately or unfortunately, that has stuck with me for all of my years. Even today, I run scenario after scenario in my mind. If this happens, then what is going to be my response? There is not a day that passes, not one day that passes, that multiple times a day I think about, if this happens, my response is going to be this, because I want to be prepared. Now, these, this idea of being prepared fits the verses this morning as we close out this chapter 21 in Luke's Gospel. It's very important for us to hear what Jesus is saying. Now, some of you will be glad that we're finishing chapter 21 and actually next week getting to a birth narrative in Matthew's gospel, and that's good. But I promised you all along I would give you along the way some of the birth narrative woven in to these what would some call end-time prophecies of Jesus 
in chapter 21, this Olivet Discourse. And so we looked at this future prophecy that Jesus had, that he gave, and then last week we looked of Jesus' return, and this week we're going to finish this chapter, verses 34 through 38, and it's about being prepared. Listen to what Jesus says. Be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighted down with dispensation or drunkenness and the worries of life, and that that day will, will not come on you suddenly like a trap, for it will come upon those, all those who dwell on the face of the earth. But keep on alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Now, during the day, he was teaching in the temple, but at the evening, he would go out and spend the night on the mount that was called Olivet. And all the people would get up early in the morning and would come to him in the temple to listen to him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. I would pray this day, Father, that you would illuminate through the power of your Holy Spirit our hearts and minds to receive what you would have for each of us through this, your word. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Now, the story of Jesus' birth has to be one of the most well-known stories in all the world. If you want to segregate it back to the Western world, I would dare say that even those that do not believe that Jesus was the Son of God, if you were to come up to a non-believer in America today and ask them, what is Christmas celebrating? They would tell you it's celebrating this person they call Jesus, who some believe to be the Messiah, the Son of God. It is a common story, well known, and over the last 2,000 years, though there are those that have not believed, it is a continuation of the story of the birth of Jesus Christ, which we believe and we hold that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. The fact is, is that he was born. Now, that is very little debate of anyone that can say Jesus was never born. We have it in the Holy Word, but even more than that, we have it as recorded history in the secular history of the first century. Jesus was born. It is an interesting story, don't you think, the birth of Jesus, Joseph going from Nazareth, going to Bethlehem. This is... Um, to me, just so interesting as God's story unfolds in the birth of Jesus Christ. Luke 2, 4 says, Joseph went up from Galilee to the, uh, from the city of Nazareth to, to Bethlehem, which is the city of David, because he was of the house and the lineage of David. Now, Joseph takes Mary, who is his wife, and she's nine months pregnant. She's due. Interesting, isn't it? You know, I'm not sure that Joseph was prepared. I like Joseph. I think he's a great guy. You look at the fact that he knew that Mary was pregnant was not his son, the angel came to him and told him. Uh, Mary knew that she was, had conceived by the Holy Spirit because she had been told. And so they are going to, Jerusalem, to Bethlehem, and she is nine months pregnant. And though God's plan is unfolding just the way God planned it, I'm just not sure Joseph was prepared. He did not call ahead and make room at the end. 
He did not send a text message to make sure everything was going to be right. He did not send an email and say, we're going to be late. It's night. We've had our donkeys had some problems. We just couldn't get there in time. He did not do any of that. He was not prepared because there was no room for them in the inn. You say, well, Marty, he didn't have all of that, and that's very true, uh, being facetious here. But, you know, he was not prepared because what he could have done, and he didn't, was he could have sent someone ahead. He could have sent someone ahead. He knew that they were traveling from Nazareth to Bethlehem. He didn't. But God's plan unfolded perfectly, perfectly. Exactly the way God planned it. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the city of David, just as it had been prophesied. God's God's plan, God's timetable, God's perfect preparation for the birth of his son. You see, God was prepared So you fast forward from the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem and you come now to this last week of Jesus' life. And Jesus is about to return to heaven and it is there that he will take his rightful throne interceding on our behalf. And so before he goes, Jesus is preparing his disciples about what is to come. I believe that God and his son Jesus, very much so wants us to be prepared. He wants us to be prepared for what is ahead. I believe scripture does that for us. And I believe not only was Jesus speaking at the time to his disciples on the Mount of Olivet, but he was also speaking to us. You only have to go to 2 Timothy 3, And know that all scripture being inspired is for teaching and reproof and correction. Is for training and equipping. Scripture is to prepare us for what's to come. And Jesus in this passage on the Mount of Olivet as he is teaching his disciples is preparing them and ultimately us for what is to come. Now, remember, this is the last week of Jesus' life. Most scholars believe this is taking place on Wednesday, and they believe and understand that Jesus is giving this to his disciples, ultimately handed down for all time. And so the next day, we know what happens. We know it's the uh, preparing of the Passover uh, meal. Jesus sent his disciples into Jerusalem to prepare. And so on this night, he is sharing with them preparing them for what's next. So today, what I want to do is give you four kind of words or phrases that I believe help us, through this passage, prepare ourselves for the coming of Jesus Christ. The first thing that Jesus tells his disciples is to be vigilant, to be on guard in verse 34. The believers are to expect that he is going to come back. He is going to receive his bride, the church. He's going to receive her to himself. The church at Thessalonica modeled itself in constant vigilance, watchfulness, readiness. These were marks of this early church. And believers kept on guard, kept alert, Because they, as we today, did not know if Christ was going to return. In fact, they thought that he was going to return before their generation was over. All believers need to expect the coming of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus tells us it can arrive like a thief in the night. Jesus gives warning throughout the scriptures and the gospels. And we have other places where Jesus gives us understanding of what is taking place. And so I want to share a little bit from Matthew's gospel this morning about what Jesus illustrates, emphasizes about being ready, being ready 
for the coming Christ. Jesus in Matthew, the 24th chapter, beginning with verse 37, says this, For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. He gives three illustrations in this text of what it will look like. He says, for those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they did not understand until the flood came and took them away. So will the coming of the man, son of man be. Then there were two men in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Therefore, be on alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. This is the first illustration that the Lord gives in this understanding of being vigilant. And so he is saying, you need to be careful. You need to understand. You see, 120 years, people saw Noah building an ark. And they continue to eat and drink. They continue to marry and be given in marriage. They continued to disrespect Noah, even though he gave them constant warning. How do we know that Noah gave them constant warning about what was going to take place as he is and his sons are building the ark? Second Peter 2.5 tells us Noah was a righteous preacher. A preacher is someone that proclaims the word of God. And so Noah, during this time, preached, but yet the skepticism and unbelief, the rejection of the coming judgment was there. And Jesus, in this passage, says in Matthew 24, 39, until the flood came on them and took them away. They were not prepared. Surprise, surprise. He further says there's two in the field, there's two in the meal, one taken and one left. People will ignore the warning signs. They will be unprepared of what's to come. The judgment. The judgment that will fall on an unprepared world. The second illustration that Jesus gives in Matthew, he says, But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on alert and would have not allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you must also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will come. And so Jesus gives this illustration. And we know that if we knew someone was coming to our house, we would be prepared. If someone was going to rob us, we would be prepared. Now, if it was uh, at my house with my son, with all the guns he had, he would be at the door waiting for them. Um, If it was just me, I would probably call the police and say, uh, someone's coming at 4 o'clock today to rob my house. Would you mind being here? Uh, Of course, they would think I was crazy, wondering how I know someone's going to rob my house. But the illustration is such that Jesus said, if you knew the time, you would be prepared. Well, we don't know the time. He's still saying, be prepared. The final analogy that he gives in this chapter of Matthew's gospel, he is comparing a wicked slave and a good slave and them being prepared. Listen to what he says. Who then is the faithful and the sensible slave whom his master puts in charge of his whole household and gives them food at the proper time? Blessed is the slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. So this particular one is prepared. This one is ready for the coming 
at whatever time his master may return. But, the Lord goes on, but if the evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time, and beginning and began to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards, the master of the slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour where he does not know. And he will cut him to pieces, assign him to a place with hypocrites, in a place where there will be weeping and the gnashing of teeth. It's not surprising that a lost world lives differently than the believers. The mocking of the Lord takes place. Peter tells us when the promise of his coming is not happening. In other words, where is the promise of the coming? For since our fathers have fallen asleep, all continues to be just like it has been since creation. And so Peter is saying, look, the world is saying, I don't see it happening. It hasn't happened yet. Why would I think it would happen? But he goes on to say, you need to be prepared. It is inexcusable for a believer to disregard what God's word has said about the coming of Jesus Christ. In fact, as a believer, when we discount, disregard that in some way, John tells us in his second letter, the eighth verse, that we will lose eternal rewards because of our unfaithfulness. Not that we lose our salvation, but we lose eternal rewards. God calls us to be prepared. Secondly, he calls us to be spiritual minded. So this verse continues this way. He says, be on guard, which is to be vigilant. Now, this is the way you do the so that. We know that important follows that. Your hearts will not be weighed down with dispensation or drunkenness or worried of life at the coming of that day, so that it will not be a trap to you. And so the Lord does not want our hearts weighed down with the worries of today. The worries of today. He wants us to be prepared for all that is coming and all that is going to happen. And so if you remember, when we were doing the... Um, Seeds falling on the road, the seeds falling on the, in the weeds and the thorns. Jesus said this in Mark 4, 18. The others are the ones whom the seed was sown among thorns. They are the ones who heard the word of God, but the worries of the world choked it out. The worries of the world choked it out. You see... We're all going to have worries. We all are going to have problems, struggles, temptations. We live in a fallen world. But how we handle those, how we handle them, is going to help us or in turn not help us in our preparation in this walk with Jesus Christ. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about the worries of the life, the life in which we live. And he gives this understanding for us about who he is and his faithfulness. You remember that song we just sang, Forever God is Faithful. Forever God is with us. Forever. Listen to what Jesus says when it comes to the worries of life. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat, what will you drink, nor the body, as to what you put on? Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow, nor they do reap, or gather into barns, and yet the heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much, are you not worth much more than they? And who are you, by being worried, can 
can, listen to what he says, can add a single hour to your life. And why are you worried about the clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you, not even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what shall I eat or what shall I drink or what should I wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all of these things, but your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So he ends with this. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough cares, troubles of its own. Struggles, temptations, we're going to face them. We're going to have them in our life. How you deal with them is part of your preparation. The Apostle John says this, and I love this verse. He says, Beloved, now we are children of God. It does not yet appear what we will be, but we know when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him just as he is. And this is the verse I want you to hear. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies themselves just as he is pure. You see, we have to be spiritual minded. We have to live in a spiritual mindset so that we are ready for the coming. So that we know when he appears, we are ready. Don't let the troubles of this life weigh you down. Don't let the troubles of this life be such that your worries overcome your relationship with Jesus Christ. Thirdly, Jesus tells us to be evangelistic. So how do we know that? He says in verse 35, for it will come upon all those who dwell on the earth. In other words, this judgment is going to come upon all. This second coming is going to happen. The anticipation of the Lord's glorious return ought to be enough for us to stimulate us to personal evangelism. In other words, telling the story of Jesus Christ, warning the lost. The Lord's return will produce universal judgment. Except on those who have come to faith in Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus, through his eternal salvation that he has given us, he calls us to himself. And so while we know that he's going to return and we know that day is going to happen, we should be such that we are not fearful, but yet we are evangelistic in sharing the good news because we should not want anyone just like Jesus to be lost. It should be a message that we have, living out the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But I will tell you that the church today Many churches today, I'll correct that, not all, but many churches today abandon the truth of the evangelical message of the gospel. Some say, even though they talk about Jesus and salvation, say that in love and tolerance, if you just say that you're a Christian, then God's going to receive you into heaven. There are others that say, you don't even have to do that. Everyone's going to heaven. God's not going to damn anyone to hell. 
And so just live a good life. If you're a good person, if you live a moral life, if you're doing things that are good, if you are even worshiping God, though you don't believe his son is the son of God, is the savior of the world, that's okay. You're it. You're in. You're on your way. There's churches also that are contributing to the loss of gospel evangelism because they believe in giving people who come to their churches what they want. In other words, whatever the whim of the day is, let's do it. They do not confront sin, judgment. They do not believe that we have to have any repentance. That's archaic. And so effective methods of evangelism is such that you make people feel comfortable, you cater to every whim and desire. And you can say, Marty, you don't know what you're talking about. I do. There's churches in this city that do exactly that. The idea to get sinners to embrace Jesus' message, they want it to be less offensive. Such teaching relegates God and his word to a subordinate role in the church, and it elevates entertainment over preaching. The Great Commission is not a marketing manifesto. Evangelism does not require a slick sales pitch. What it requires is truth in the gospel. Truth in preaching. I will tell you that I believe firmly today evangelism in the church needs to come back. You look at the last 40 years in the church and church attendance and see where it has gone in the last 40 years. And I do not believe that it's because we have instruments or drums or we're singing contemporary hymns that has driven people away because we aren't doing the 16th, 17th, 18th century hymns in many churches today. And people will say, oh, that's the reason it's that music. It's not the music. It's the degradation of the gospel that's not being preached. We are no longer saying you have to repent and come to faith in Jesus Christ, confessing your sins and turning away from them. Truth in love. Truth in love. And that's the message of the gospel. And so Jesus reminds us in this text, for it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of the earth this coming of his. And then finally, he tells us to be faithful at all times. To be faithful at all times. In verse 36, he says, but keep on alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape these things, these things that are coming, be prepared to escape these things that will take place so that you stand before the Son of Man, approved, right in the eyes of God. Jesus concludes his message with an urgent exhortation for us to be faithful at all times, to be faithful in our walk with him. Throughout the New Testament, over and over again in Jesus' teaching, he tells us to be faithful, to walk faithfully with him. And he gives us that understanding of how to do that as we walk with him. There's two promises that are given for those who preserve faithfully in this faith, this relationship with Jesus Christ, the salvation that God has given you. And in that first promise is that we will be caught up with him. We will escape the judgment that is to come those future judgments of the world. That is a wonderful promise that the Lord has given us. 
that we will be with him at the marriage feast of the Lamb. And it is there where the second promise will be handed out. I mentioned a while ago about second, uh, the second letter of John, that eighth, chap- that eighth verse. And we know and we look at Revelation and know that there are rewards in heaven. And there's those who say, I'd rather be, I'd be glad to be a gatekeeper in, uh, in heaven um, than to be great rewarded in hell or whatever. The, the thing is, is don't worry about your rewards. The rewards are coming and they're going to come to heaven and know that God is going to receive that to you, give that to you because of your appro- his approval of you through Jesus Christ, his son. It is only through Jesus that we have approval before God. He has forgiven us as we've come to faith in him. And so God is telling the disciples and ultimately telling us, be faithful at all times. There's going to be struggles. There's going to be problems. There's going to be issues you're going to face. In fact, there's going to be death. And you need to be prepared for these things. Hear this. We cannot do it in our own strength. Paul realized that he could not do it in his own own strength. Romans 7.24 says, Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? In other words, I can't do it, God. I'm not going to be able to face all the trials, all the things of this world. How am I going to do it? And he answered the question. Paul answered the question for us. And the question is answered by only through the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. It is only through the cross of Christ and that anyone can stand before God the Father, pardoned, cleansed, and redeemed. There is no other way. And because of the Holy Spirit of God, we have the power to go through life in a way that glorifies our Father in heaven. There is no other way. You can't do it on your own. Your fallen nature is going to get in the way. God, through his Son, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is the one who comes and gives us the power. Gives us the power to be vigilant, to be spiritual-minded, to be evangelical and evangelistic in our message. And it is the Holy Spirit that enables us to be faithful at all times. The one who came to Bethlehem. Just a little baby. Born who lived and died and rose from the dead so that we may have life in his name. We need to be prepared. Christ is coming back. We can bury our head in the sand. We can think, as Peter said, uh, people were thinking of his time. It's been a long time. They're just not, he's just not coming. We can have all of that in our mind. But the fact is, Christ calls us to be prepared. In the last verses of this text, you remember what Luke tells us? says that Jesus was going to the temple daily. And he says people were listening to him. Let me tell you what you can do to be vigilant, spiritual-minded, evangelistic, and faithful at all times. Listen to Jesus. Listen to Jesus. How do we do that? We listen to him in our prayers. As we pray and communicate with God, God communicates with us. Listen in your prayers. Secondly, listen in your worship. When you come to worship God in the body of Christ, listen to what God is speaking to you. The lyrics of these songs that we sing are powerful. The scriptures that we share 
in the call to worship, the confession, in the preaching of God's word. It's powerful. Listen to what God is calling to you, saying to you through his word in worship. And then secondly, or thirdly, is listen to what God is saying as you study his word. As you're in Bible study, as you read your devotions, listen to what God is doing through his word in your life, what he is asking you to do, maybe what he's asking you to give up, or maybe preparation for something he's got coming for you. The truth is, he calls us to be prepared. And the more that we listen to his voice, the more prepared we will be as we faithfully walk with him. This is what God calls us to do. This is who he is in Jesus Christ. He sent his son to die for our sins so that we would have relationship with him and then calls us to be faithful in that walk so one day we stand redeemed, ready, approved before our Father in heaven, our creator. It's because of Jesus. I would tell you today that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God that dwells in you is what you need to latch arms to so that you are prepared for this coming because none of us, not a one of us, know when that will be. But he is coming, and thanks be to God for it. I'm not afraid of it. I'm actually anticipating it because I'm ready. Are you ready? Are you prepared? for the coming of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for this passage that not only reminds us of your teaching of your son to the disciples, but it reminds us to be faithful, diligent in our waiting, anticipating your coming. We don't know when it is, but you've just called us to be faithful, to glorify you in all things. And so this morning, Father, I pray for those of us that are believers, those in this place that have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I pray, Father, that we would be prepared. Father, if there's those here or maybe someone watching on the live streaming that is a believer but has hardened their heart or turned away from you, I pray, Father, today, right now, that they would fall to their knees and confess to you. Repentance, confession, turning back to you, knowing that they need to be prepared for your coming. And, Father, we certainly pray for a lost world. There are so many that we know personally, everyone in this place, every single person knows someone in their life that does not believe in Jesus Christ. And so, Father, I pray right now that each of us would begin praying for that person that you lay on our heart. Pray for that one person that you've put on our heart to pray for that needs to come into a living redeemed relationship, salvation in your name. And it may not be us that helps to lead them, but we certainly can pray for them. Father, prepare us for what's ahead. Help us to be prepared and ready. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.